Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earth materials. So in this particular video we're going to look at some of the non-silicate minerals. So this is going to correspond to section 4.9 of your textbook. So I'm sure you remember, but there are several classes of non-silicate minerals, which includes groups like the carbonates, the sulfates, the sulfides, the oxides, the halides and the native minerals. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through these groups. We're going to look at an example or a couple of examples from each group. We're going to think about the chemical formula, and we're maybe just going to discuss a couple of the diagnostic features which are associated with each group. So in the case of the carbonates, there are two main carbonate minerals which are most common. They are calcite and dolomite. Now, in the case of calcite, you can see we have a calcium, calcium sorry, bonded to a carbonate group, the CO3 group. And in the case of dolomite, you can see we have calcium magnesium bonded to a carbonate group. Now you'll notice that we can change the number of carbonate groups in our mineral. So in the case of the calcite mineral, the chemical formula only contains one carbonate group. In the case of dolomite, the chemical formula contains two. But the makeup of the group remains constant. It has to have one carbon, it has to have three oxygens. Essentially, if you see this group in your mineral, you're looking at a carbonate. Now, in the case of the carbonates, we can see in terms of the minerals themselves, they all have a vitreous luster. In the case of these calcite crystals, you can see they are uh, they have good cleavage. You can see they have free cleavages. They actually have rhombohedral cleavage. So the cleavage planes aren't meeting at 90 degrees. They are, in fact, slightly, uh, slightly uh, offset. Um, but most importantly, as I'm sure you remember, all these carbonate minerals will react with hydrochloric acid. And it's that chemical reaction which is going to tell us that we're dealing with a carbonate. And then from there, we can refine and work out exactly which carbonate mineral we're looking at. So the next class of non-silicate minerals we'll be looking at are the oxides. So in the case of the oxides, we have a metal bonded exclusively to oxygen. And the amount of oxygen is variable. You can have metal bonded to one oxygen atom, two oxygen atoms, three oxygen atoms, etc. So here we have a couple of examples of common oxide minerals. So we have magnetite and hematite. Now, both of these minerals are iron oxide minerals. You can see there's the iron for the magnetite and there's the iron for the hematite. And in the case of magnetite, you can see that's bonded to four oxygens. And in the case of hematite, it's bonded to three oxygens. So the, as I said, the amount of oxygen will vary depending on the mineral. Now, most oxide minerals tend to be metallic in nature, so very often you will see this shiny luster, which you can see here with this magnetite sample and here with this hematite sample. Um, in the case of hematite, it can also sometimes take on this slightly rusty red appearance. Now, unlike the carbonates, which can be a very substantial part of rocks, uh, the oxides will typically only be what we refer to as an accessory phase. So they'll often only make up a very small fraction of most rocks, typically no more than about 1%. Now, the important thing about oxides is when they do occur in large quantities, they are actually very important economic minerals. So magnetite and hematite, for instance, are very, very important minerals when it comes to iron mining. So if you can get magnetite or hematite in high enough concentrations in a relatively confined area, you can essentially have a rock which you can mine to extract the iron. So although oxides are a relatively small proportion of most rocks, if you can get them in high enough quantities, they are economically quite important. So our next group of minerals, uh, or should I say non-silicate minerals, are the sulfides. So in the case of the sulfides, we have a metal bonded exclusively to sulfur. And just like the oxides, the amount of sulfur is variable. You can have a metal bonded to one sulfur, two, three sulfurs, etc. So here you can see a few examples of common uh, sulfide minerals. So here we have the mineral pyrite, sometimes referred to as fool's gold. You can see that iron bonded to two sulfurs. Here we have the uh, mineral galena, which is lead sulfide, so that's one sulfur. Then we, down here we have a mixture of copper sulfide minerals. So some common copper sulfide minerals are charcopyrite, which is this one here. Covalite, which is this one here, and Bornite, which is this one here. And you can see two sulfurs, one sulfur, four sulfurs. So the amount of sulfur is variable, but most importantly, you have to have a metal or metals bonded exclusively to sulfur. Uh, 
Now, just like the oxides, the vast majority of sulfide minerals are metallic, so you can see in all of these cases we have a shiny appearance, that metallic luster. Now I'm going to be honest and say that this particular Galena sample is actually quite dull looking. Most of the time Galena will have an extremely metallic luster, it will be, it'll have an almost mirror finish on it. It's quite spectacular when you see a really good crystal of Galena. Now, just like the oxides as well, they are typically accessory minerals. They'll only make up normally less than 1% of most rocks. However, once again, just like the oxides, if you can get them in high enough quantities, so high enough concentrations, you can essentially produce a rock which you can mine to extract metals such as lead, copper, zinc, etc. Now, the interesting thing about the sulfides is, is the sulfides can only form in an environment where there is relatively little oxygen. Now, the reason for this is, is if there's oxygen around in the environment when these minerals are forming, the sulfur will naturally react with that oxygen. And if it does react with that oxygen, it's going to form sulfate which is another group of non-metallic minerals. So this means that when we see sulfide minerals in our rock, we can use that as a guide to say, at some point during this rock's development, the oxygen concentration got quite low. So the next group of minerals we're going to look at are the halides and the sulfates. So in the case of the halides, of course, we know it's a metal bonded to a halogen. Now that could be chlorine, fluorine, iodine, or bromine. But as we've discussed, chlorine and fluorine are by far and away the most common halogens, so they are the ones most likely to form minerals. In the case of the sulfates, we have a metal bonded to an SO4 group. That's the sulfate group right there. So just like we were discussing, sulfates will form in environments where we have oxygen in quite large quantities. If there wasn't oxygen, instead we would form sulfides. So just bear that in mind. Now, the reason that the halides and the sulfates are combined together on this slide is because they actually tend to occur in the same environment. The vast majority of, uh, of, ha of halides and uh, sulfate minerals are associated with evaporation. So they're a type of sedimentary rock which we call, well they're related to a type of sedimentary rock which we call evaporites, and evaporites as the name suggests are, are produced when we have a large volume of water evaporating away, and as the water evaporates away it can't take the material that's dissolved in the water up into the atmosphere with it. So as you heat up some seawater for instance the water evaporates away and goes into the atmosphere, but the stuff that was dissolved in the seawater, like salt, can't go into the atmosphere, so it gets left behind. And eventually the concentration in the remaining water gets so high that you will start to crystallize out salt crystals from that seawater. So in the case of the halides and the sulfates, they tend to be associated with this process of the formation of evaporites. Now, when it comes to evaporite rocks, the halite and the gypsum especially will tend to be very, very common minerals because the evaporation of seawater in particular will of course lead to the liberation of large amounts of salt. So that will be crystallized in the form of halite. Whereas gypsum on the other hand will be uh, formed during the um, evaporation of of both seawater and freshwater in quite large quantities. So where we have these evaporite deposits related to the evaporation of water, uh, the halides and, and the sulfates in particular will be very, very common minerals. So um, although the environment in which they can occur is relatively limited, so there aren't a lot of evaporites out there, when evaporites do occur, you can often get quite substantial thicknesses of halite and gypsum forming, or more accurately, halides and sulfates forming due to that process. All right, thank you for watching everybody, and have a good day.